All right, welcome to episode one of More Doors Podcast. MF stands for More Doors. We're going to go ahead and get started right now. All right, welcome to episode one of More Doors Podcast. We are excited to bring this show to you. This this show is sponsored and brought to you by Deep Blue Capital. If you are looking for the right investment group, if you're looking for operators that are going to go out and bring the right deals back home, if operators that um, are doing their due diligence to make sure that they're really being good stewards of your money. Go to steepbluere.com. Go sign up for their newsletter. You can see the projects that we're currently doing, the past projects that we have, um, as well as get on our investor list so that you can get notified when uh, we have new opportunities available. So uh, thank you again. Deep Blue Capital. Just go to steepbluere.com. So uh, on today's show, this being the first one, what we really want to do a breakdown is is we have I've got our our my business partners we have uh, Matt Buchowski with us Brian Force and we just really want to go over whom we are our experience in investing and you know there's a lot of changes going on in this industry right now so we we've started this 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 podcast and this show um, to help educate potential investors. Um, and maybe maybe they're beginners, maybe they're intermediate, maybe you've invested in a in a limited partnership deal uh, previously. Maybe it's gone really well, and maybe it went really well because the economy um, and everything that was going on during that time really helped uh, escalate it and elevate it. But now you're not so sure. Should you invest in another deal, another project? What should you be looking for when you when you place your money with with an operator in a in a company? So we'll break that down. Um, Brian, Man. welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, buddy. This feels so crazy. It's like the first day of school all over again. We've only done like 250 podcast episode of our residential podcast, and now it's like day one of this one, and I feel a little butterflies. It's like. Yeah. This is a fun, sexy thing. But my name is Brian Force. I am the uh, leader and CEO of uh, the residential real estate team, Livy and DFW, uh, and co-founder with Nick of Homeward Property Management and a partner here at Deep Blue Capital. Now our new joint venture. And uh, a little bit, I guess, about me. I got a start in real estate much like Nick's. He was a pizza delivery boy. I was a bartender. Not the same thing, but kind of the same cut of thing. <laughs> I think bartenders a lot better than a pizza delivery boy that's fair that's not how i really it's not what i called myself by the way i'm like i'm just a pizza delivery boy <laughs> it, was, it was the first uber eats yeah, exactly. yeah. Was the, the ori- first, no the original the original uber eats and then i got into residential real estate uh, i've been doing that for 13 years now i've built up living dfw to uh, about 150 million dollar team in 2022 uh, i've been an lp on many 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 deals i started my investing career years ago as a limited partner um actually on some of Nick's development deals, and then I've expanded from there, and, and now uh, I'm an operator and general partner with Deep Loop. Uh, and I kind of have like the the all-American story of getting started in investing, like starting with like really nothing, knocking doors, making connections, building it up, taking risks, learning a lot, doing all that type of stuff, and uh, I'm really happy to now do our first podcast as multifamily operators. I'm very excited about this. Yeah, well, thanks, Brian. And and. Let's let's. I want to go over to Matt, right? Because this this partnership that we brought together is, you know, it, it marries our strengths and weaknesses, right? And and there's something that I would, I, I'm definitely would be open to sharing on on where our strengths lie together, where our weaknesses are for for each of us individually. And as you are listening to this show, um, I want this to be an educational, you know, an educational show on. You know what? What is an LP, right? What is what is a limited partner? What is it? What is a GP, a general partner on that? What does it look like when you invest your money? Um, you know, we're 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 gonna take you on a journey of that. We'll do some case studies of some deals that we are in, some deals that we just uh, we just closed on, um, as well as you know even breaking down some maybe some underwriting some uh, deals that uh, didn't work out for us, right? Because that way that way we want to keep bringing you guys back and ultimately. 
our goal would be for you guys to you know reach out to us and let's have a conversation. Let's have a conversation what it would look like to uh, maybe become a, an investor with us and, an, and a limited partner. So, uh, Matt, tell us a little bit about your backstory. Uh, well, number one, let me just say, I kind of feel like a member of the Cool Kids Club now. Like, I see you guys <laughs> you doing the podcast all the time. And I'm like, how do I, how do I get there? And now I'm here, and it's very, very surreal. <laughs> was, at least you said surreal. I, I was waiting for you to say it's very Underwhelming. underwhelming very yeah, disappointing no, yes, the studio is yeah. way smaller than i thought yeah. it's, it's really cool i look for every opportunity to see myself on camera so i can realize how big a forehead that i have ah. <laughs> uh so i've been investing since 2016 uh i, I used to uh, i still fish a lot but i was going on these fishing trips with a good friend of mine and and he taught me everything that he knew and then one day he said you know let me know if you want a deal because i got a guy who's got some and i took him up on it and I closed on my first deal in, in April of 2016. I actually just sold that deal oh, nice. uh, 10 days or so ago. And um, it was very, very lucrative and wasn't planning on selling, but it was hard to say no. Yeah. And then I bought my first multifamily in 2017. It was a eight unit in Arlington with a good buddy of mine. We went full cycle on that uh, back in 2021. Mm. And just kind of fell in love with the whole deal evaluation and touring and opportunities to make more money and drive value um and i'm just like i'm just pulled into it the gravity of of multifamily investing everything from talking to brokers to reading uh, uh, offering memorandums and doing the underwriting on deals partnering with you guys raising capital and then getting our hands dirty and actually driving value in these assets is it's uh it's super exciting and and something i get a ton of fulfillment from yeah and and you know we're number one i'm grateful to have you as a partner because you know if you'll notice as this show goes on and and you start listening to multiple shows on this is matt has this if you look at him you're like he's not an underwriter he doesn't he doesn't project <laughs> he doesn't project someone who's going to geek out on a spreadsheet and want to go play with the numbers to see how to improve it but um, after doing a after doing a deal that we just closed on in Waco, Texas, um, after running what seventeen variations yeah, of, of, scenarios. of scenarios, I was like, "All right, Matt's the guy, <laughs> right?" And and so you know we're we're just grateful to have you as a partner, and and that's one of the the you know the compliments that that the strengths that Matt has versus what we we don't have right now. And we're growing. So my name is Nick Good, by the way. Um, I don't think I said that in the beginning. I was going yeah. to remind you. Yeah, wait yeah. if I had to call you on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So my name is, is Nick Good, and I run a residential real estate team as well, the, the, the Good Home Team. Um, we've been around. We started that company in 2009, but have been a licensed residential real estate uh, broker since 2006. Um, and then really got into the investment game 2010. Um, uh, it, I, my, my brother and I bought a short sale. Um, we we quickly closed on it and sold it. I think less than ninety days later, made good money on that, and that that began that began our investment career. And since two thousand ten, we started buying single families because um, that was when all the foreclosures were happening. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, auction dot com was hot. Um, you know, there was people uh, you know people that were in distress behind on theirs on their payments and their mortgage. So we were able to go and negotiate short sales and buy foreclosures and and get into wholesaling, you know, flipping and then you know buying and acquiring rental property. Yeah. So at one point, I'm trying to remember how many single families we had at one point. I think it was like probably forty to sixty range. Um, single families, we started selling that off and got into the multifamily space. So, you know, from that multifamily space, it was um, a development deal fell into our lap in Denton, Texas. And, and we we took that from it. Was, it's a 72 unit duplex development today. Um, but when we bought it, there was only five five units on the ground. And so my brother, my brother built out, completed that 72 unit that we still hold to, you know, to this day. Um, and then that moved into us doing. Um, um, another duplex development in Denton, Texas. That's a 58 unit that we have, um, and and that one's going amazingly well. And then we have an 89 uh, townhouse and duplex development project that we we've completed phase one on. That was during COVID years. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So development development during COVID years was not fun, <laughs> and and we're we're coming out of that aftermath, and now going into that rising interest rate market. 
and and it's it's almost like that one two punch and we're starting to see you know we're starting to see especially in the the multifamily space there's 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 cracks in the foundation of uh, people's investment strategies mm. right and i just it, to me what it feels like is is um you know it's kind of like in the in the hedge fund game or the mm. stock market game you see these stock market brokers and they always talk about all their wins mm. yeah mm-hmm. and they never talk about their losses and everyone is smarter than everyone else. There's, you know, if you talk to one guy and you mention another person's name, they're like, that person's an idiot. <laughs> right. And it's like, <laughs> what I don't ever want to do is, is, is think that we're smarter than everyone else. What I like to say is that we're, w- what we look at is when we're going to underwrite a deal, you know, we're going to, we're going to toss it in the ring and we're going to figure out if it's, if we're saying it's a home run, right. That, if things don't go our way, which we've seen over the last three years that, you know, COVID, the, the uh, shelter in place through, through you, know, you know, the free money being given out and yeah. now um, the rising rates is that if things don't go our way, a home run shouldn't turn into an out. Sure. Right. And we're starting to see that happening where these, these people bought something in 21 and 22 and now they're behind on, on payments. Yeah. And it's putting the investor money at, at jeopardy. Totally. So, I mean, Matt, you as a, you know, going through that underwriting, like walk us through that portion of it, because that, I mean, the underwriting skill is it, number one is probably one of the most important parts of, of doing our due diligence. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, I can go on for hours on, on <laughs> underwriting, but I think, you know, to me, it's hard to be a steward of people's capital including our own, right? Because yeah. we put our own, own money into these deals too, mm-hmm. uh, without knowing the intimacies of, of the underwriting model, right? Where are you, you know, how are you calculating your vacancy? How much can you drive rents? Uh, doing as accurate as possible, a job as possible, forecasting your entry and exit cap rates and operational costs. And, and I think, you know, Nick, you, you, I could unpack like five things you just said, but like, what I think happened in, in from 2020 through the first quarter of 2022 is there was so much inexpensive money flooding the streets that were driving up prices because there was so much demand that you didn't necessarily need to be a good operator to make good money. Yes. Right? And now what I think is going to happen is great operators are going to separate themselves from good and bad operators very very quickly and i think i saw a stat the other day that i think there's like 1.5 trillion dollars worth of short-term money coming due in the second half of this year and into 2024 and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with that because i think some very aggressive assumptions were made if you're if you're underwriting a deal and you're being super skinny with your OPEX budgets and super skinny with your vacancy and you're skimping on your working capital when you when you underwrite your deal. And then in any one of those categories, your vacancy rises, you get hit with a massive insurance renewal is what's going on. Counties are getting very aggressive with property tax collection over your estimates. And all of a sudden, you don't have any cash in the bank. That's a tough place to be. And I think we're, to your point, Nick, we're starting to see that. One thing I did kind of want to circle back, sorry to segue here, but what I want everyone who's going to listen to this show to realize is that, at least for right now, the three of us have day jobs, Yeah. right? Now, each of those positions that we have give us access to high net worth individuals or data or opportunities or the ability to network with people in our own industry. So I think there's, there's a lot of complimentary stuff. My point here is that for those on the fence about getting into multifamily investing, either as a GP or an LP, or perhaps people with limiting beliefs on why they can't do this, we're here to disprove that point, Yeah. right? Yeah. Our, I think we all agree that our ultimate goal is to do this full time, sure. right? But while you can absolutely scale up a three, four figure portfolio while maintaining a family life and a work life and that balance, yep and still find a way to do deals. And we'll get into like what that balance looks like, I'm sure, over time. But if you're, on, if you're listening to this show and you're thinking that you can't invest in multifamily because you have a day job, 
or you're not sure how to do it, like stay tuned because we're going to dispel all of that stuff. Well, and I think, you know, to give, you know, I want to bring as much actionable stuff. I'm always like the guy who's trying to bring it back to actionable stuff on our other podcast too. Like if you, you, you know, when you get started, you, the, the question always for, for everyone, if you've got a little bit of money in the bank and you're like, I, I want to get into multifamily, right? It's, it's just the, what do I do? Right. Multifamily investing feels very stout. Like it is, it's an easier psychological thing to go put 20% down on a single door as a rental because it's like easy, self-managed, like very few moving parts. Multifamily is actually not any different. It's underwriting, it's inputs and outputs, right? But it feels very, very overwhelming for a lot of people. And so the best place to start is as an LP. And one of the reasons I think that people, or one of the things I, th I think people really need to take note of, especially in this environment right now, is what to look for as a limited partner when you're investing mm -hmm. in deals, right? Because as you guys have made the points, it was very easy to make deals look really sexy for the last few years. And one of the things that limited partners, limited partners, by the way, are just investors in the deal. They're essentially silent partners. They're putting up their money for a return, but they're not operating the pop, uh, property, right? One of the things that I think keeps people um, from either engaging as a limited partner or asking a lot of questions and maybe getting into the wrong deals is like, this is like new to them. And so they're afraid to ask questions for like fear of like feeling silly to the yeah. sponsor and stuff. Like yeah. I know, um, you know, my first LP deals were actually on, on people that I actually knew very intimately. So I didn't feel weird asking questions, but I know how overwhelming it could feel to, to, to ask questions and to really kind of, you know, do your own sort of judgment and underwriting yourself of the, the, the deal and qualify it a little bit because if you aspire to kind of grow and do bigger things, you don't want to look like you don't know what you're talking about. And so a lot of people just refrain from asking questions. And when they refrain from asking questions, they either get into bad deals or they just don't do deals at all because they're a little afraid. What I learned on, on a kind of our first deal together is as an operator, you actually love answering questions, big and small, for a couple of reasons, if you're a good operator, I should say. Um, one, because it helps you engage with your people and you are here to be a steward of people's capital. And so you want to have those relationships because if you do a great deal, you're going to find five other people from every single person that you did that deal with who are also going to want to do the next deal with you. So you want to answer questions because you want to be a person who does what they said they were going to do. And so you like engaging with your people. And two, it's a reality check. Every question that you have to ask or answer for an LP before they invest in your deal is another gut check of like, let me double check my shit and make sure that I've got it all buttoned up, right? Like on, on, on the deal we just did, we had a lot of questions from potential investors that made us go back and double and triple and, and uh, check our math and our scenarios. And I, I actually, some of the, the, the issues around potential vacancy put us into a whole nother negotiation with the seller that got us a big, big, big win there. And a lot of that sparked from LPs asking questions about what is our worst case scenario. And so I would say if you're looking to get started, Obviously read, obviously engage, obviously network, but underwrite your sponsors by asking questions. That That's what I think people didn't do very well in 2021 and 2022, and that's why you're seeing a lot of these deals blow up, is I think if we could go back in time and look at some of the LPs who should have been asking questions, if we really analyze some of those deals, now knowing what we know, it seemed weird back then to be like, well, what happens if your rate floats up to six and a half percent? This deal blows up. Back then, we'd be like, well, that's never going to happen. It fucking happened, right? And not enough people ask questions yeah. about what if this happens. And so I think if you're an LP, don't be afraid to ask questions. It's actually really good for the operators to have to answer them. Well, I think yeah, I think ultimately is that you know over the past few years is is people got caught up in the hype, mm -hmm. right? And and there are some people that. This has become in, in in the syndication capital raising game. It's become a popularity contest, and from from that, it's like you know, you know, these celebrity like syndicators. There's no way that they could do anything wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Look at their track record. Look at X, Y, and Z, and they're you know what we've what we've come to realize is they don't they're not going to show the bad, right? And right? Because the bad is going to start you know having people question. And I always tell tell people, especially when they invest with us, is like, look, investing money is one thing, but you need to know who you're getting in bed with. And and when things aren't going your way, if if the get, if our business plan is not being executed the way that we had we had planned it out, how do the operators respond? That's going to be the biggest question. And how do they communicate? You know, are they hiding things? 
are they just do they just go radio silent? Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know what what I have learned over the past few years and the deals that it, that I've syndicated and raised money on on that I that I personally GP'd um, is that um, I mean look on um, some of my deal flow uh, COVID hit we were building COVID hit yeah. prices tripled to go build um, then we had labor shortages then we had you know material shortages right supply yeah. chain issues. Um, and then we had the cities, you know, delaying permitting and what, what we had budgeted time frame wise to get up and running, you know, went from, you know, it doubled the amount of time to get into, into, you know, starting to earn revenue. And then ultimately like I had a partner pass away mm-hmm. and then that th- throws a whole new wrench. And so when you look at it, it's like, go look at the operators yeah. Yeah. and, and who, do, who, who, what type of people are they? Are they in this? And, and Matt made a good point is that, look, we have day jobs and we have day jobs because because the capital raising business isn't going to be our full time income. Right. Because oh, yeah. when that happens, that's what what's going to happen is then you've got it. You've got a syndicator. You've got a capital raising person who like, I just got to get I got to get these people into the deal so I can earn my money. Right. And are they going to start shortcutting? Are they going to start cutting yeah. corners? Yep. I don't want to like talk crap about anybody who makes a living from, um, you know, maybe the educational side of syndicating and things like that. But there is a pressure on you to continue to do deals when that is like your brand, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, right. I agree with that. You know, yeah. and, and so then you get into a really, really, really hot environment with cheap money. And you've got an established brand, and every deal you put out there just looks like a freaking golden egg. And then all of a sudden, you've just got more money flowing in than you know what to do with. But it's probably coming from places of, of maybe a little lack of downside knowledge. Yep. And then all of a sudden, you get into this environment like we're in right now where, I mean, I don't know what the figure you threw out was earlier. But there's there's certainly going to be opportunity for syndicators out there to to do really great deals going forward. Unfortunately, possibly to the detriment of people that entrusted operators to really be great stewards of their capital for the last few years. Agreed. And and look, I think I think it's all perfectly human, right? So I think a couple of things uh, happened. It was very easy to get caught up in the hype around the market the last couple of years. People were chasing deals. You know, you, you have um, a lot of uh, social status associated with the wins and stuff like that, and people on social media with the Lambos and throwing money mm-hmm. around and stuff. And, 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 you know, that stuff that those records have stopped playing, it right? Is. Bottom line. And, and I think the conservative approach is the right approach. Um, and that, that, that takes a lot for me to say, because sometimes I tend to like be aggressive on, on things, but you know, you got to take a step back and realize are your assumptions too aggressive and what if X, Y, and Z happens. But um, you, you kind of can't get caught in the analysis paralysis of it. One thing that, that Nick said kind of uh, gave me a thought process here. Putting your faith in an operator, right, is, is extremely important. And one of the things I really appreciate about the three of us is that the three of us are leaders at what we do, right? And it's our job to, A, hold ourselves accountable, B, hold our teams accountable, and C, good, bad, or ugly, we've got to be completely transparent, right? And if we miss a month or we miss a quarter, it's our job to, like, share that news yeah. and, and, and recalibrate and make the adjustments to our business processes. We're going to take that same discipline and that same integrity and that same character into representing our, our LPs and our investors in the multifamily game, yep. right? I think that is not everyone can say that. Right. I also think there's there's a whole conversation we can have around disc profiles and personality <laughs> profiles and, and 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 stuff like that. But I think there's a certain uh, profile, for lack of a repetitious term, um, that of someone that you want to entrust your funds with mm. that can do the analysis, that can execute on the analysis. Putting a number in a spreadsheet is completely different than being able to go achieve that yes. and understanding what it takes to achieve that. And, and and those are some of the strengths that I think the three of us but, you know, combine for. And you mentioned, you know, this next this next phase yeah. of, of the market and the cycle is that it's going to show, you know, good operators. What we thought were good or great operators. Maybe they're average. Maybe they're not great. Right. Um, or maybe they actually are great. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, you know, only time will tell. But 
the what what and I've been given advice on this and and the main thing is is number one is the due diligence is great so that's number one and and then ultimately believing in the project and then how do you go and manage right it's the processes through the management yeah, of, absolutely. of this is a business yeah and you know when 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 cash is easy to make people get you know they get fat and sloppy mm-hmm. and during these times it's it's hitting the KPI metrics and you know like what we're doing with our project right now is we're instituting and, and really holding the the management team you know to the fire yep. right mm-hmm. because you know you start to fall behind it's good you know you might it might be harder to catch up it's very hard yes. if not impossible yes. right and look i think within 30 days of owning this asset we've you know we've instituted our capex plan right we've gotten a couple of bad tenants out we're getting the mural painted we're all over social media generating leads we've got the vas working behind the scenes and and i think having having that plan is one thing being able to execute on that plan on a dime is completely different and and you know if i'm an lp and i'm looking to put money in I want to know if my GPs, do they have virtual assistants or the day after they're going to close, are they going to go start look for them and yeah. how do they weed out the bad ones and what are the processes and all that kind of stuff. And, and I think it's important for people to know that, A, we have those capabilities, yep. day one, right? And if you're going to talk to a, a GP on another deal, vet that out. Ask those questions. Like I think curio- IQ is one thing, EQ is a whole different topic, but curiosity quotient I think is super important. I think the three of us thrive on that, asking each other hard questions, yep. asking brokers and property managers those questions and being able to receive and, and respond to those questions from our partners and investors. Yep. No, 100%. It just takes it out of the theoretical realm, like you said before. It is uh, underwriting in and of itself is not easy, but it's easy if when you have a deal to just look at the underwriting and go, this will work, right? And yeah. then kind of be done with it, you know? Yeah. If we didn't have our game plan ready to go on this last asset, we would be really far behind right now. And, and I think that that's what strong operators do is is – take the sexiness out of the underwriting and actually put the game plan together so day one you hit the ground running. Otherwise, especially in this environment, you're so fucking far behind. Great. Just, and, you know. and, and Nick said this before, right? We went through, what, 17 different versions of our underwriting. And I would say probably three quarters or maybe 80% of that was you guys coming back to me with different what-if scenarios yeah. and you know pricing changes and market adjustments and interest rate adjustments. And you kind of got to roll with the punches. And at some point... If that deal stops making sense, you gotta just put it down and walk away. Yeah. Like how many other deals have we taken a look at, and it it's it looks really good and yep. it sounds really sexy, and then by you know forty five minutes into it, we're like, nah. that's what people fall victim to, though, right? Like people that just need a deal. We're we're looking at another deal right now that we've been talking with with the broker, or I guess he's the wholesaler, really for a while now, and he keeps coming back to us like, man, we really we're close. I think we really make this deal work. Like, yeah, you just you need to get closer yeah. like to where we are. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like, we're just not falling. For, you know he, what by I mean? the way, he called me this morning. Did he? <laughs> yeah. Uh, see, there you go. And we, you know, probably had the same response. Let us know when you get to our mo- our number. And, yeah. and, and that's one of the things that, you know, if you're just itching to do a deal, you'll make mistakes. Yeah. You really will. You've got to have the prudency and the discipline to go, man, I know you keep calling me and I want to make the deal work too. I just can't wait till you call me and tell me the right number because that's the only way it works for us. Agreed. You know, <laughs> agreed. So as we go into you know our future episodes and and why you know someone would really want to just hit that subscribe button, um, or if they're they're watching this because this is also a video. So if you're listening on this audio, like you can go watch it on YouTube um, and on Facebook and and you know number one, see what we look like. It's not. Not anything good Don't, on it. The, yeah, you won't be yeah. too impressed. Don't judge us on the look. <laughs> right, we have good voices for radio. Yes, exactly. Yes. But you know, the the opportunities like you just talked about some of these deals, right? They they look good from far, but far from good. Mm-hmm. And and as we go through then an underwrite them, you talked about um, earlier. You talked about there's a lot of short term money that's starting to, to mm-hmm. that's going to start hitting and becoming due. Yeah, explain that a little bit. Yeah, so I think there was a period of time over the last couple of years where uh, deals were pricing was inflated Mm -hmm. and a lot of these deals needed big capex budgets to make them work and the answer to that money was bridge financing right Um, and bridge funds and those are those types of loans were are typically short term 
They're different than hard money, by the way. We right. can talk about that at another time. But bridge financing is typically a one to three year term with the opportunity to renew. And what these lenders do is they allow you to acquire the asset and then build in your CapEx. But what that enable and, and typically at a lower leverage than agent or right. higher leverage, excuse me, than an agency debt, 75, right. 80 percent loan to cost. So because those funds were out there, because that money was out there, people were willing to take bridge debt on even some stabilized assets because they needed to because of the higher price. Which is a big so now you, exactly. So now you're buying an asset on day one at an inflated price, right? At a high interest rate, higher than agency or, or maybe your community or regional bank. Right. And you only have two, maybe three years on that financing before you either need to renew, refi, or sell. Yep. So now in this economy, we're in a rising rate environment where refinancing may not be an option because the interest rates that are available today may be higher than your yes. bridge financing, right? We're also lenders are also we're also seeing lenders become more conservative with their leverage and yep. maybe you can only get 65, yes, 70% loan to you, value. You bought at an inflated price and now you're trying to refi but your asset price has dropped, you might not be able to cover the difference. Exactly, <laughs> right? Uh, and we're also seeing some cap rate decompression, yeah. right? So if you forecast um, your refi at a 50 to 75 basis point higher than your entry cap rate, which or your market cap rate, I should say, and that market cap rate fluctuates, and you can't get the cap rate, you can get you can't get comps that match that cap rate. You're not getting the appraisal value that yep. you need in order to get off that bridge debt. Yep. So now your refi options taken off the table, right? You can't return equity to your shareholders. Um, can you sell it? And if so, for what? For what? Yeah. Right. So I, th those types of deals are going to start to come. Those distressed deals are going to start to come to market soon. I think they are probably already happening, but they're being handled very, very quietly yeah. because the loan officers have contacts that can handle the deal very, very quietly yeah. and you have off market opportunities and stuff. But I think those are going to start to, to to become more and more prevalent here in the second half of the year. Who do you think, you know, absorbs those deals, right? So I, on, on the larger assets especially, right? Mm. Is it institutional recapitalization because they can just come in cash with no financing? And like, I just feel like it's a feeding frenzy for institutional buyers. I think there's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines, yeah. right? But I think the money that's sitting on the sidelines is is smart money. Mm. And I think the people that are, and the people and the funds and, and the companies that are able to take advantage of those opportunities are gonna be very, very smart about their entry price. Right. And bottom line is, in, a, in an environment where prime is eight, yeah. right, and you're borrowing it between 8.5 and 9% mm -hmm. compared to when you were at three and a half or 3.75%, those companies are gonna, and those people are gonna say, all right, I'll buy your deal, but you're probably lucky to just get your equity back, yeah, right? Let alone any sort of upside. And A, I'm thankful that you know, we're in a position to be able to take advantage of those opportunities when they sure. surface, right? Um, but I think there's going to be some people out there that just have to go back to their investors and say, you know what, I can give you your principal back right. and whatever dividends I was able to pay you for the last two years. Right. But we have to exit. Yeah, 100 percent. And that's, you know, I, I want that to, to, to kind of sink in and be the lesson here is like, you know, in, in our in the multifamily or just the investing game in general, we, we, we do have some hubris around the idea of like what a good market is and what a bad market is, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, everybody just, just you know, stay out of this, uh, you know, st just stay on the sidelines for this, you know, you know, because of the environment and the economy and all this type of stuff. There's really no such thing as a bad market. There are just different markets that provide yep. different opportunities, right? Like if you just look at it in a vacuum, right, 8% being prime, so you're borrowing at 9 right? That's just a variable. That doesn't exactly. mean don't do deals. It means whatever the deal looks like, it has to make sense in all environments, right? Yep. And so that's why smart money right now is fine with where rates are at and will probably continue to be for a little while because it's blowing up deals that were only done in an environment where those variables had to fall in line and couldn't survive otherwise, Agreed. right? It wasn't about necessarily, oh my gosh, like, I shouldn't say this. It, it, what 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 makes these deals a lot of deals that you know kind of the whole sector a, a little bit of a ticking time bomb right now is is not the fact that you know we 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 you know rates rose and all that type of stuff yes rates rose that's a variable 
but people fundamentally violated what should be their standard operating procedures and how they go about doing deals. Meaning, if I have a, 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 an asset that doesn't need a massive CapEx budget, I should never do bridge debt. Just like that should just be, I shouldn't be borrowing short term, high interest money just to get a deal done. It really doesn't matter what rates are. That's just a standard principle that you should never violate. And that's what causes big corrections in markets. Yeah. And so the idea that, you know, it's a bad time to invest or whatever. No, there's no bad time to invest. There are just different variables and you always need to be disciplined. I agree with that 100%. And, and look, I, I know there's a number of investors out there that have been sitting on the sidelines since, you know, mid 2021, when people realized that we were just printing money and inflation was going to catch up with us sooner rather than later. I'll put it to you this way. Um, I'll be closing my fifth deal on Monday since Q4 of 2021. Nice. Right? I haven't borrowed money at less than five and three quarters percent, right? And I still have, we we still yeah. have a number of opportunities in our pipeline that I would move on in a second, right? right? Somebody said to me once, uh, not too long ago, very successful multifamily investor, he says, get completely unemotional about interest rates and insurance. Yeah. And if you can plug those numbers in and still make the deal work with your conservative underwriting, you should move on it. Yeah. Right? People are going to wait. Like, wait and hope are the only two four-letter words that I don't like. Yeah. Right? I hate <laughs> waiting and I hate hoping. I'm going to do it. I'm going to figure out a way or I'm just going to move on. Yep. And, and I think there's... There's an opportunity right now for savvy investors that can underwrite deals well and execute more importantly. And and when this thing comes back around in two, three, four years, we're gonna refi and roll the shit out of yeah. a bunch of properties and and really scale up. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's what's funny is because that is the opportunity. And when you talk about, you know, wait and hope, like we talk about wait. The, 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 the opportunity that you have now as an operator, even an LP that's working with good operators, is you're going you're gonna to be able to get the benefit of a lot of people that, that kind of violated their principles and their deals are kind of going south now, right? And if you're smart and disciplined, you can move on those deals. And then when you get into an environment that looks a little bit closer to what it looked like probably pre-COVID, COVID, then you're really going to be able to refi or you're go like you're going to be able to, to 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 have some sort of capital event or dispo or something that really really enhances your returns right exactly. um but what's funny is that a lot of investors are waiting for that environment to come before they even make a move Agreed. which is the wrong move right you just need to abide by your principles and like you said get unemotional uh about the variables right like we have this thing we do it in the residential side Right. Clients and prospects say this all the time. Like, I'm just waiting for rates to get back to normal. Well, what's normal? Right. There's no such thing. They're just it's just a number right. on a fucking computer screen. Right. If you just get unemotional about it and operate with discipline in whatever environment you're in, then you'll actually take advantage of the improvements in rates. But if you wait for rates to improve, well, you're actually waiting for the thing that was going to enhance your returns and you're actually not making moves at all. Agreed. Now you're actually putting yourself at risk. Yeah. You know, and I think that's where people get a lot like that's standing on the train tracks. I, I think it, this whole concept of, of waiting for the market to turn. Yeah. It just did. Yeah. Bottom line. <laughs> we're li we're right? living it. <laughs> we're, we're going through it every day. And, and look, the uh, what is it? The average market takes 10 years to fully reset. Yeah. You want to wait and do you want to deny your yourself and your family a new house or investment opportunities or building a legacy you got to adapt yeah you know and and to your point it's just numbers on a computer screen and numbers on a spreadsheet if one number goes higher there's probably another that needs to come lower yeah, right it's about so as simple figure, as it gets. figure out what the price that you can afford at the new interest rate looks like yep. and if it works great if it doesn't work move on yeah i think the, the name of the game today is finding whether it's residential or multifamily, is finding a price where the deal works for you don't fall in love with it don't overextend yourself yep. don't clear out your checking account and your operating capital account yep. buy the deal buy deals the right way and 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 just Simmer down and wait for this to come. Wait, wait for it to come full cycle. A hundred percent. I don't think we'll ever get back to three percent or three and a quarter percent money again, at least in our generation. Yeah. But I can see us going back to pre-COVID at four, four and a half, four and three quarters yeah. percent. Yeah. And I'd be fine with that. Yeah, because yeah, the deals that we're buying at eight percent now, those are going to be worth a they hell look of a lot more. Pretty good at four, four and, and a half. half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. The thing. No, absolutely. <laughs> and, and 
So, so as we go on to, to other shows, right, and, and what we would like to have our listeners do is if you have a guest that you would like to recommend, please recommend a guest. We want to have guests on the show. Yeah. Uh, we want to be able to, to share, you know, that knowledge with you, their experiences with you. That way you can be the most informed investor. Um, you know, whether you're going to GP a deal, whether you're going to be an LP. Um, but as we as we move on through the rest of this year, right? So, you know, we're recording this one in uh, April of 2023, right? So um, we've got we've got some some months left to figure out, you know, the CPI report came out yesterday, yeah. mm-hmm. um, right? It was yeah, a yesterday. little bit yeah, yesterday. yesterday, a little bit lower than uh, estimates, which is good. So lower than estimates. The we're just gaining everything back today that we gave away yesterday, Jesse. Okay. Yeah, the market. Welcome to the American economy. Yeah, the, everything's the market, made up, and the points don't matter. Yeah, the, <laughs> the market. The market tanked yesterday because of it. But so what? What we're going to see, and and what we're looking for in underwriting deals on is we're preparing for that that short term debt that's coming due. Yep. And how can we strike and take advantage of it, right? Because ultimately, what the opportunity is. It, over the next over the next few months is that we may be operating in a space that just like pre you know just like covid years that's not coming back we may not see this this distressed debt that's going to be coming due um you know f- probably for a long time would you agree agreed yeah yeah so i think i think if we're looking at it from a from an investment opportunity the the buffet line is going to look pretty good yeah, absolutely. You know, towards the last half of this year, yep. maybe into the first part of 24. So what, what should, what should an investor do, Matt? Um, we're going to be underwriting deals. Yep. What should an investor do to start getting ready? Um, and, and maybe doing their due, due diligence on, on a syndication, on a syndicator. Um, let's, let's call it stay hard capital. What, what kind of due diligence should they be doing? I think number one, you, you you need to really vet out your GPs, right? How many deals have they done? What market cycles have they uh, purchased and operated in? And uh, what are their real capabilities, right? What property management companies do they work with? How are their other deals performing? Uh, ask hard questions, like interview your GP as if yeah. you were interviewing for a job or having someone interview you. Yeah, for or a like job. a guy you're going to give a hundred grand to. Right, yeah. <laughs> something like that. Exactly. <laughs> um, I think it's really important to also look at your own personal finances. Right, the market has taken a massive adjustment over the course of the last twelve months. Uh, I think crypto. If I saw you know Bitcoin uh, in in Ethereum have rebounded a little bit over the course of the last eight it or makes nine months. No sense, but it I has, don't get it yeah. either, right? But uh, I think you got to look at your finances and figure out where you could potentially reallocate some funds into something a little bit more uh, economically resilient investment opportunities. Um, better tax advantages. Better too. tax yeah. advantages, right? Look at your look at your taxes and figure out where you want to take more deductions and where you need to take more deductions. And then think about yourself, you know, five, ten years down the road and figure out how you want to rebalance your portfolio. Right. For me, it's, you know, there's a, it, it's a legacy piece. I want to make sure that my kids are taken care of. And, yeah. you know, I had I was probably overweighted in stocks and and I, I wanted to make some adjustments. And I'm I'm willing to take losses on stocks in order to move money into real estate right sure. now. But that's me. Yeah. Right. That may not work for everybody. May not work for everybody, and, and that, that's that's actually a really good point. Is one diversifying your portfolio and and, and making it resilient. Um, you know the differences. I, I would say this to anybody that's really looking to get started in investing, especially as an LP, is is again, interview your sponsors, be prudent, and and remember that this is wealth building, not necessarily just money making. And what I mean by that is stocks are very liquid. So your money's going to go away for at least five years. Mm-hmm. Don't be the person who puts your last fifty thousand dollars in savings into a deal, yeah. thinking that like now you're rich. You're going to say goodbye to it for a while, and you should. Uh, but make sure it's money you can say goodbye to. Yeah. You know, especially and, and just again, that's kind of underwriting your own personal finances. You know, I keep a healthy amount of money in stocks as well. I'm diversified, um, but I value that level of liquidity as well for market environments that are that are volatile right if i had all of my 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 money tied up in long term investments and the market corrects at a huge rate or a huge level you know all of a sudden you're 
wealthy on paper, uh, yeah. but you know you can't afford you know steak that night or yeah. food. <laughs> you know what I mean or whatever. So um, I would say just be very prudent with your personal finances as well. No, I I agree with that, and and ultimately, um, you know how how I explain it even to myself is that this is you know investing smartly should always return something mm -hmm. you know even if it's breaking even right if all, all things go go wrong and you break even on it but there you know i always explain to people that have invested with us maybe even the some of the younger the the younger generation on that they're, they're like what's the worst case example and i always say like well you lose all your money right that's worst case if you do an investment um if you go buy a single family rental uh, you go try to do a flip. What's the worst case that could happen? Actually, you lose you lose your money and then some. Yeah. Right. Yep. And so ultimately, you know, we we want to we want to always have our investors, um, you know, understanding that look, we're going to go and we're going to go to at bat for the and fight for their money. Yeah. We're we're going to go in the ring. Yep. We're going to make sure that you know we're we're putting the right procedures, the right policies, the right strategies in place. Um, so that when we do get to year three to year five and we're exiting that, you know, we're able to to number one, have skin in the game, you know, the skin in the game and say, look, we were able to go execute a game plan. Yeah. Look what that is. Yep. And that's the bragging rights of it. Agreed. There should always be some bragging rights. Right. By the way. <laughs> totally. If you're right? doing your job, right. If you're doing your job correctly and saying, hey, you know, we did we said this was going to happen and we execute on, you know, they that operator deserves the bragging rights. Yeah. Because you know they, you know, while while investors are putting money in, they're also, you know, they're also guaranteeing the GPs are guaranteeing yeah. the debt, yep. Yep. right? They're doing, they're going at, to work for, yep. you know, for your money, right? And so ultimately, um, you know, when when looking at that operators again, the track history is great. How transparent are they? Yeah. If a deal goes wrong, how do they respond? That's that's my number one. Because, that's huge. You know, because because yeah. you know. You couldn't have predicted COVID. You couldn't have predicted as 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 fast and rapid you know interest rates are going to be. There's right. always people that were screaming that rates are going up, rates are going up, right. but they've been screaming that for years. Yeah. And and you know just like just like the weatherman, the weatherman can can get it wrong until until one day he's right and see it'd be like I told you, yeah. I told you it was going <laughs> to snow in July. <laughs> and and you know it just takes that one time. And ultimately the 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 understanding is that that. You know, we want to make sure that, or as as an investor, and you're putting money with a with a GP, is that when when shit hits the fan, how are they going to respond? Yep. And that's it, because when things don't go well or un uh, you know economic conditions that uh, that no one could prepare for, are they going to communicate with you immediately? Are they going to go radio silent? Yep. Yeah. And that Absolutely. usually creates you know when they go silent, that's usually you when when you know the uh the mind starts evolving on what's yeah, going on 100 sure. percent, and that's true i mean just for some of the operators that we've worked with that i've worked as an, as an lp I, i'm in two deals as an lp right now we've actually polished cash distributions um and i'm actually kind of happy we did because when we get the communication it is incredibly detailed we look at all of the we, we the financials we talk about why we're doing this right we were smart enough to have rate caps right and things like that so the the asset is well capitalized we're doing well and we have prudent stewards of our capital if i just stopped getting distributions and no one was talking to me i would just assume the yeah, worst right. absolutely so communication is key totally right? yeah. you can you can deliver even less than stellar news as long as you're delivering it people usually understand and as long as you're executing on your game plan and being prudent then then you know obviously that's that's what people count on you for yep you know? 100%. So uh, we want to wrap up the show. We want to, you know, we want to make sure that you go to Deep Blue Capital. Um, look, go online. Go if you're listening to this on, on Spotify or on iTunes or wherever you're consuming this. If there's a place to leave a review, please do so. Mm. Right. Because ultimately, you know, our our goal is to continue to put this out, you know, into in the investor world so that this is an education piece, mm -hmm. right? This is not, hey, look at us. You know, we're not going to be pounding on our chest unless we do something great. Yeah. Um, we want to we want to celebrate that and, and uh, tell everyone about what's going on. But uh, again, we want to we're the goal here is to break down and and do case studies on opportunities that we've done um, on ones that maybe we're evaluating and why we killed it mm -hmm. um, or ones that maybe we lost out on and yeah. we underwrote it this way. And why do we think we lost? Yeah. Because we're not going to win every every Definitely. offer that we make. If yeah. we're winning every deal, 
then mm-hmm. we're probably paying too much. Doing yes. something wrong. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, again, thank you guys for your time on this. Hit that subscribe button. Leave us a review. Uh, go to deepbluere.com. That's our sponsor of that show. We are we are the uh, we're the founders of it, just for full transparency, because Brian already mentioned that earlier. So um, this is brought to you by Stay Art Capital. Just go to stayartcapital.com. Go sign up for the newsletter. Right, You're going to see the projects that we're doing, the updates on, on current projects, um, and ones that we have uh, sold off, as well as it's a place that uh, we can communicate with you on. So, uh, guys, that's a great first show. Hey. Oh, awesome. One in the tank. This is great. One in the bag. I love it. Yeah. Right. So, uh, be sure, in the next episode, you're going to want to you're gonna want to tune into that one. Um, I have a feeling that we're going to break down um, probably the, the deal that we did. It's yeah. Probably Probably yeah. just case, go over, first one, first case study. Yeah, Love first it. case study. Yeah. Nice, and and of course it's the one that we've done, so we we know that one really really well. So thank you guys for tuning in, listening or watching this, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next one. And please reach out to us. We we'd love to hear your feedback.